Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists and political leaders about the most important news events in our community. I'm Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we look behind these headlines. New conflict at the Santa Barbara School Board as unhappy parents press for the ouster of the superintendent. The Board of Supervisors funds an innovative program to respond to mentally ill homeless people. Candidates for city council hit the final weeks on the campaign trail as hopefuls for state legislature position themselves for 2020. And we spin some scenarios for what happens when the music stops in the local political game of musical chairs. Our panel tonight, Delaney Smith, reporter for the Santa Barbara Independent. Nick Welsh, executive editor of The Independent. Josh Molina, who covers politics for Newshawk and former city council member Dale Francisco. Thank you all for coming. So Delaney, there's a coalition of parents angry at uh, uh, Superintendent Kerry Matsuoko about a host of issues. They've got 700 and some signatures on a petition that his uh, contract not be renewed when the board takes it up in two weeks. Uh, what are they mad about and what's gonna happen? Yeah, uh, so there's five different reasons they listed among them. Um, they said that under Matsuoka's leadership, um, the school's facilities have been degraded. They listed um, the windows at Santa Barbara High School, for example. They said that because they're broken, in case of an emergency, kids can't jump out the window. That's one example. Um, the bathrooms at Santa Barbara High also, they said, are uh, dilapidated. Um, they also said that he irresponsibly handles the school's funding. He, they believe that spending the funds on uh, programs like Just Communities, for example, is irresponsible and it should be put more towards academics with the kids' um, reading comprehension scores being so low. Um, there's three other reasons. Those are their top ones. It's his management style, too, isn't it? That yeah. It ticks a lot of people off, his kind of lack of yeah, and, um, being out in the community, last lack night, of transparency. Yeah, last night was probably one of the first times um, in a while that Matsuoka actually really addressed, um, addressed these issues. For the most part, he's largely silent when it comes to these controversies at school board. He'll sit there and he'll be silent for the whole three, four, five-hour meetings at times. Last night, he um, debunked um, I think the word he used was uh, set the record straight. Yeah. Um, and that, that, was, um, that was new for him. And he, and he said that most of the comments that they've been um, spewing are incorrect and they're false. So this kind of upset started with the Ed Barron situation last year, the early year. Then we had the Matt Academy. We yeah. had uh, the ongoing dispute about just communities. Um, the stadium uh, project, uh, yeah. a, lot, a lot of money and stuff. Peabody. And it is the first time that uh, Kerry pushed back. And is that not, Josh, you would agree with me, because they have hired a public information officer, <laughs> Kamala Barnwell, a.k.a. Cami Cohey, who has decided to help them rebrand? Do you think that's what's going on? <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to, I don't, I'm not even sure what your question was there. Uh, well, she said, I mean, and, and you're correct. That usually Matsuoka just sits there and takes it. Now, in the last two meetings, all oh. of a sudden, everybody's pushing back. I, so you're I, I was just going to say that I can say that uh, Cammy has um, personally told me that she's working on getting Carrie to address people and um, be more public and, and more transparent. So perhaps that is correct. I think it is. Um, and... It doesn't really help because they're there speaking in this education jargon to each other half the time. Well, my biggest observation covering the school board is they have a communication issue in that they're very defensive and they are defending the work that they do and they come across as being smarter than everyone else because they're educators and they're missing the point. Even if they b believe that to be true, they're talking to people who are parents of children. And what do people care most about is how their children are treated. So they need to do a better job of acknowledging the problem before they tell us this is what we're gonna do anyway. And Kerry, uh, he, it's a soliloquy. He, 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 what he has done is take a time to address all the stuff that's been happening in the public comment, 
but it's one way. Yes, and, exactly. And, and so it feels as though it's lecture time from dad as opposed to a conversation. What he really should do is just have a town hall forum and talk about these issues. And instead pretend of, that he can listen. Well, it's a really a communication yeah. issue. But last night is a good example because one of the other things people were mad about was the gate program. Right, and, and Matsuoka was yet again silent when it came to that. Um. So they tried to <laughs> torpedo it at Washington uh, last spring. Mm -hmm. Everybody, all the parents threw an upset. Last night they were supposed to come back with a report about it. So what did they decide? Um, I mean, they didn't decide anything last night. Um, it was just I, I left at 11, so I'm not <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, it, it, was, it was purely it was informational. Um, Dr. Ramirez um, provided information about, um, first Raul of all... Ramirez, yes, the um, assistant superintendent for... Right, who six months ago, Matsuoka kind of left um, to hang out to dry when the parents were attacking him up there. Matsuoka didn't or say a word. Or threw him over the bus. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, how you want to word it. Um, last night wasn't nearly as intense. Um, but at the same token, uh, Matsuoka was silent when it did come to that. But yeah, so it was just an informational report. Um, parents were still coming up saying, "You can't, you can't end the magnet program." But um, like like Ramirez continually reiterated, they're not ending the magnet program. He was just providing demographic information. But they're certainly not going to expand it. They're, they're certainly not going to expand it. No, it seems like, and they didn't say this, but it seems like they're aiming to expand the cluster program um, more because they were presenting much more research about how the cluster one, program is effective. One more question. October 22nd, they're going to decide whether to extend this contract for an additional year, $354,000 total package. What will the vote be on the school board? Ooh, that, um, that's... The correct answer... Three to two. Three to two. <laughs> You're predicting Laura Capps, who's running for office, and who Kate will want to appease yeah. the parents, and Kate Ford, who is the only one who really asks Knows questions. Knows what's going on. Yeah, exactly. That's likely. Hmm. You'd be likely about. And the rest of them, well, are in his pocket. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> gee, what? Gee, Jerry, I wonder why some people don't call you back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jerry, it's uh, carry on line two. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of people being in people's pockets, Nick. Uh, so after your uh, endless coverage and constant complaining, the Supes came up with two million dollars to finance a co-response to co-response teams, pairing law enforcement and mental health workers on the street. Why is this important? Well, it's important for a number of reasons. First of all, just to backtrack, it wasn't really the supervisor who was coming up with the money. It was the sheriff uh, going out and the county going out and getting grants. So it's not coming out of the general funds. And so it's a, I think it's a three-year funding cycle. And what it does, uh, co-response is one of those ungainly terms that describes a mental health uh, emergency caseworker going out on patrol with a cop. It could be a sheriff's deputy, it could be a Santa Barbara police officer. And they go out on patrol together, and there's a, a number of uh, really great advantages about that. And um, the first thing is that in Santa Barbara County, it's the only county in the state of California where law enforcement cannot declare somebody 5150, which means they can be they pose an imminent threat to themselves or others and can be um, held against their will. So if you have a, a mental health worker with a cop, that person can, oh. can declare somebody 5150. Now, that was a significant issue. There were two right now of these guys. There's Bradley Crabble, who is a mental health case worker, and James uh, McCarroll, and he is a deputy. And they went out, there was a 27-year-old kid uh, he's got <clears throat> guns buried in his backyard. He's got you know 20,000 rounds of ammo. He's got 40,000 bucks worth of cash. He's got bulletproof vests. He's living at home with mom and dad. And what do we do with this guy? And the guns are all legal. They, he had violated certain laws, stalking his girlfriend, etc. And because they were there together, they got him in a 5150 hold as opposed to just I know, very technical in the weeds. Um, and as opposed to just putting him in the psych ward at cottage, the legal significance of that is that guy can never get his guns back. Once you've been declared 5150, you are not legally entitled to your guns. So this is not necessarily aimed at street people, homeless people. It is aimed a lot at them. I mean, you, when you consider that 70, you know, about 70 percent of the daytime calls for service that the Santa Barbara police get are homeless people and 
some large amount, somewhere between 26 and 70 percent of them have serious mental health issues, there's going to be a big overlap. So, Dale, you, you're more qualified than me to estimate how uh, many tens of millions of dollars are spent on homelessness problems uh, by the city, the county, the state, and everyone else. None yeah. of them seem to have worked. Does this sound like it has any validity to you? I think the... Jerry, you're right. I mean, the overall problem is huge, and it really is a state problem. Uh, and the state seems completely unwilling to do anything about mentally ill people living on the streets. However, having said that, I think that this program is a good idea. Yeah. So is, is, it, is it a pilot program? Is it yeah, a it's a pilot program. So like, it, it really got started in spite of, not because of the blessings of uh, Bill Brown and, and the brass. Um, it was really uh, Eddie Shway and, and a couple other deputies who sort of pushed this thing up and, and made it happen in spite of, not because of, the official blessing. And so they got a pilot program up and going, and, uh, every, and it, lo and behold, it was this huge success, and everybody was saying, oh my God, this is great. One of the virtues of it is that if you're a deputy and you get, come and you respond to somebody who is in, in a mental health crisis, you've got to babysit that person for three to five hours, usually, before somebody comes and can dispose and, and take the person to the proper place. That's three to five hours that you could be doing patrol. If you got these guys out there, it cuts regular patrol officers loose how, a lot how, faster. How, how many years is the, is the grant? It's, it's a three-year grant. So and and how will they measure success? Um, one, one, at, one at a time. I mean, so uh, in the first year, roughly, I think they, did, they initiated about 380 calls and responded to about 350 calls. Only seven of those people wound up going to county jail. So what they did, they found 60 people. They said, we're going to 5150 you. Another uh, close to 60 did a voluntary. We, we're going to go to a mental hospital voluntarily. Uh, another 45 or so went to a crisis stabilization unit. So what they're doing is they're getting the overarching impulse of why this is a state grant um, is we want to get mentally ill people out of the criminal justice system. They don't belong there. It makes them worse. It doesn't make them better. So how do we do that? And so, so what they did, you have two of these guys who are operating. Now they're going to have six. All right. Okay. Well, homelessness uh, was the number one concern of California voters in the new public uh, policy of Institute of California poll. Um, and it is a big deal because the governor said he's going to do something about it. So it would be something... Now watch this transition. Of interest to the state legislature, and <laughs> as it happens, Josh, we have a state a, a, a race for state legislature going on right now. Monique Limon, our assembly person, is going to run for Senate, so there's a wide open race for assembly, and you went to the uh, Democratic endorsement uh, uh, meeting about that. And, uh, I, who, I scooped who won? you by five days, Jerry. <laughs> Well, I was looking you, forward to your analysis you, that you took five you, days you to missed, report it. You missed the lead, Josh. <laughs> was, was, the, was the problem? What I had written, but the, not you, as well. you, you missed the lead. I'm okay. sorry. So, so they had a huge. Kathy is the front runner. That was my analysis. Your analysis was Jonathan Abood is going to win. My analysis was Isn't objective, right? based on the news that happened, not based on who I had coffee. Well, with when you have my two days <laughs> many years, <laughs> my many years of experience, I should be able to. Have some tight perspective like that. I think we might need You're the a one who taught me. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you agree that Kathy's going to go ahead? You're the one who taught me heavy breathing and the lead. And the rest is just tight. Heavy breathing, yes. Heavy breathing on Mount Olympus. So and no, there, it's Josh. Go ahead. So there was a pre endorsement event at the Faulkner Gallery in Santa Barbara. And this was to determine which candidate would get the recommendation for the endorsement at the Democratic Party convention in November. No candidate got 70%, so there will be no recommendation. However, Jonathan Abood received more votes than the Who city mayor. 27 year old trustee on this. Yeah, he's 27. City uh, he's a city, Santa Barbara City College trustee. He is somebody who's been a very active progressive in Isla Vista. He's campaigned and knocked on doors for other candidates. And here he is. He has emerged as getting more votes among a very small pool of people. We're talking about uh, clubs who get a vote. We're talking We're about... very active people. 
Yeah, there are people who are the hardest core of people in the Democratic Party um, activism bubble. So he, he got more votes than Kathy. So it is significant. That's that, like a couple? Like two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is significant because here we have Kathy, who's the city mayor, who is very much uh, ingrained in the Democratic Party uh, apparatus. Duraka doesn't like when I use the word machine. So, uh, and, and, and she will vote the party if line. If she's in the apparatus, does that make her an apparatchik? I don't know. Why don't, why don't you ask her next time you have her over for dinner, Jerry? Uh, I didn't have her over for dinner. So, yes, Jonathan surprised many people because he was able to get more votes than anyone else. Monique Limon, by the way, was encouraging all of her people to do a no endorsement. Which is what... Uh, came in third, no endorsement. Hannah and Beth said Beth no endorsement. And, and Monique. Salute. And, Both said no endorsement. And yeah, and so did the damn women. And Monique says it's because I have to work probably, well, definitely, but whoever, the, with whoever the winner is. Uh, maybe she's not very happy with everyone who's, maybe someone else is going to come forward. But we had, basically, it was spread out. All it really says is that you, Jonathan Abood has some momentum, he has some support, and he's not somebody who can be easily dismissed. Kathy obviously is the front runner because she's going to get organized labor support, which is a lot of money. Um, Jason Dominguez. Which I, I think that was in my piece, actually. Don't you agree with me that Josh, as many people who are close to a millennial age, he's well past it, but closer than no, us, but I'm not is, that. Rea is reacting to the urgent rather than the important, and therefore over overstating the abood, uh, the the abood groundswell, <laughs> groundswell, and then Kathy's got it in the back. Or does Jason Dominguez have a chance? I have a hard time imagining Jason being able to pull this out. How I, many votes did he get? Like six or something? Uh, I yeah. believe he got eight. Is that right? That sounds yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, he's going to work really hard, and I wouldn't count him out, but I kind of, the way I would look at it, Cassie would be the front runner, uh, Abood would be coming in second, and then Jason probably third. What's your take on that? I don't, it, I, you undoubtedly know the situation there much better than I do, but I would be surprised if Abood had a lot of support outside of IV. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't uh, think. Uh, I mean, yeah. the district, it's a, a lot of Ventura County, and... You know, it's a more moderate, yeah. generally voting area, so yeah. I, I'm not sure. And then uh, Elsa Granados, who was uh, the executive director of uh, the organization formerly known as the Rape, Rape Crisis Center, she's also in. Uh, it's her first race. Yeah, Monique Limon waited so long to announce that she was running for Senate. Typically, the Democratic Party likes to get behind one candidate and clear the field and not have to spend a whole lot of time on having to put money into multiple candidates so they can focus on other things. Now no party is going to, or, or no one's going to get the party's endorsement. That allows people like Jason to step forward, Elsa, Jonathan Abood, Kathy. And so it's very interesting. Kathy, of course, is the smart money, but it is early. And Jonathan, he grew up in that sort of work hard, grassroots, progressive You're not going to go thing. to work for him, right? I don't know. We'll, we'll, I know. All right, what's happening in uh, the city council races, districts? Uh, so the, speaking of Jason Dominguez, side, Jason sure. Dominguez is running for assembly. He's simultaneously running for re-election on the city council in District 1. So he has his work cut, in, cut out for him because even though he's the incumbent, he's widely unpopular with the Democratic uh, Party, and they are working very hard yeah, to right. elect... Alejandra Gutierrez, and she's from the community, and people know her. She grew up there. So in a district election format, she is going to do well, particularly if Jason is over there trying to get in assembly endorsements. You, so. you, 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 you covered the, or you, you did a piece yeah. in the paper that's out now about it. What's your take on Alejandra? She, you know, when I talk to her one-on-one, -on -one, I, I, I find her very impressive and solid and passionate and stuff. But me too. But somehow she hasn't been able to put that out there. Yeah, me too, Jerry. One-on-one, -on -one, she talks about mostly what impresses me the most is her work as the director of the Franklin Service Center. Um, the nonprofit connections that she's made and the resources she's provided to the kids and their families in the east side, um, it... it it really paints a picture of her potential of being on the council. Unfortunately, uh, she she doesn't 
she doesn't really show that when she speaks out at public forums. Um, she tries to embody this politician um, kind of vibe, and she's she's not a politician, yeah. so it doesn't look good on her. Um, you think there's any way <laughs> Jason loses? I think that an incumbent who runs reasonably hard and who hasn't done anything terribly stupid gets reelected most of the time. What about his comment that we have to, uh, when did he say, govern uh, everyone's behavior? Uh, remember that <laughs> quote? That was a great one. I remember it, but I don't think most people will. Who, who's going to win in District 2? We still have one more show before. You don't have to make a prediction. Yet. Uh, it's between Michael Jordan and Terry Jory with Brian Campbell perhaps uh, coming in third and playing a spoiler. He's uh, very upset about homeless people and very... Yeah, J Jordan is, Jordan's one of these candidates, if it were a citywide election, he'd probably win because he's done so much on the planning commission and he's so well known and he has lots of connections. On the Mesa, however, he's going up against Terry Jory, who's knocking on doors, who's very meeting rooms. with people. And, and he has a lot of money. And she has support, she's got a strong political consultant, and with these little district elections, and this is why Alejandra is, is going to yeah. do well even if she doesn't win, is because it really has to do with how much you're going to work in the district. And so you, you, you were one of those two. Terry Jory. You know, at first she seems a little eccentric. Um, Marianne Williamson, I believe you That was yeah, the to. comparison I used. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when you talk to her, I mean, I mean, when you go to a forum, she talks about, I, I have a PhD and I've got a black belt in karate, so I'm smarter than you, I'm going to kick your ass. But, you know, when you talk to that's her... That's a direct quote. No, that's, <laughs> that's my, my ex, ex, extrapolation. Um, but when you talk to her, you, know, you, 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 can't, you get the sense she could get something done. You know, she's very energetic, she's very focused. Um, you know, she does say, I have a, a big brain and I get shit done, and she says stuff like that. But, um, you know, talking to people on the neighborhood committee, um, people say she is energetic, she does bring people together. And, of course, she will be the first elected official, if she wins, to come from what? The Vector Control District. It'll be the first <laughs> stepping stone. A new pathway. A new pathway to power. <laughs> Dave, now, David Pritchard tried to forge that path to yeah, power. Yeah, but look where it got him. Yeah, I got him look to where the got him, right? <laughs> so, so why isn't Mike Jordan running away with this? Uh, that's I mean, all his years on a planning commission, he knows. I mean, he's well qualified. And I think if it were citywide, he would be running away with it. Um, right. The district elections have really thrown things into, it's, it's, it's a different world. And one of the problems, I think, with the district elections, which I didn't predict, I predicted plenty of other problems, was the, the lack of talent in some of these races. That's not, yeah. Yeah, not yeah, yeah, but this one actually, I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a pretty this good is, candidate. These five, are good candidates. You have five, in that district, you have five but, interesting yeah. candidates. And like they're, they're all running for the so-called right reasons. Nobody's doing this as a stepping stone to you know, fame and fortune. Yeah. Um, if this were a citywide election, Mike. Jordan and Dominguez would be one and two. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think I would still say uh, Michael Jordan has... I, I would definitely you know, bet on him. When, on when are the uh, independent endorsements? Um, we endorse... And the first district that comes out tomorrow, and that's going to be um, Alejandra. And we're waiting till um, next week to endorse in District 2. All right. You're not, you mean you're not quickly endorsing now. Hal Conklin? Qu quickly now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dale, Dale has actually done incredible research on the city charter. I had to. In the event that Kathy is elected to, a, to the assembly, what scenario occurs? Because she will have about 11 months left right. in her term. Right, and if you read the city, count, uh, city charter section on vacancies, it's not exactly clear what's going to happen. So I went back and I watched the city council meeting where they actually discussed what it was that they wanted. Uh, here's what this it boils down to. This is a full service news program. <laughs> I did this for you, Jerry. What it boils down to is uh, if the term of the person who's leaving has a year or less uh, remaining, then the city council does not have to call a special election. If it's more than a year, they are required to call a special so, election. So in this case, it would be less. It she would be would... less. 
Uh, they wouldn't be required to call, and I seriously doubt they would, given that the mayoral race is going to be in November 2021 anyway. So they so. would just fight with each other about who gets to be exactly. the acting mayor? Right. That's what it would be. <laughs> and, and, and I strongly believe that they would appoint the most experienced council member as the interim mayor. That would be Randy. Uh, as long Randy, as Randy's going off. Yes, but he could be appointed mayor. Anybody could be appointed mayor. Right. Anyone could be appointed mayor. Jerry Roberts. Acting, no, I think Dale. This is Dale. This, this is, is my company. chance to return to stardom. I, th I um, agree with you about the Randy scenario. Don't yeah. you? Don't you? As long Randy? as I think, as long as he promised not to run for mayor at the regular election, I think. <laughs> but he would break the. He would promise. Me, no, I know Randy's pretty straight. He would probably. Do you think he would? He would do it? I don't know. That would I don't, be interesting. I, I don't mean, know. Go ahead, because I've heard that he is under pressure not to. Hmm. Uh, from the family? From the family. Mm. But yeah. That wouldn't shock Well, who on the council would, would, would make their move to get it? Eric, Megan, Harmon, Oscar. Oscar? They did ranked choice voting, one anonymous mayor told me. Oscar would be uh, the mayor be, because yeah. he would be everybody's second choice. <laughs> Newsmakers, where political careers are born. <laughs> <laughs> and vector control, don't forget. Vector control. All right, well, we have to uh, leave it there. Uh, thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, Delaney Smith, Josh Molina, Dale Francisco, and Nick Welsh. <laughs> Nick and Welsh, the best columnist at the Santa Barbara Independent. Well, that's coming oh, yeah. out, too. That's coming out, too. How's that going there? Good. <laughs> Next week, we'll find out if, if you won this year. I'm pretty sure this is your year and the Dodgers' year, too. So don't, don't <laughs> the Dodgers are tonight. We'll okay, thank out. you for watching. And uh, please check out our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, for my regular blog posts on media and politics in Santa Barbara and beyond. And if your insomnia is particularly troublesome, Check out our YouTube channel for an archive of past shows and interviews, including our four special programs on the current campaigns for city council. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montalvo, and to our crew, Elliot, Michael, Ryan, and Mark, and our producer, Lizzie Rodriguez, who's pinch-hitting for senior, top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy executive producer, Hap Freund. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Newsmakers.